Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1170. If it stops becoming fun, it's time to reevaluate and realize what you're doing. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest, Russ Rosenberg. Hey, Russ, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I sure am, Mark. All right. Russ Rosenberg is an entrepreneur who has been racing for 13 years. His racing career began in autocross and quickly grew to club endurance and eventually vintage racing. Russ pilots a 1966 Yanko Stinger, which I hope we're going to hear a little bit more about that, and a 1976 BMW 2002 and is a member of the board of directories for Corinthian Vintage Auto Racing. He just released his first book titled Racing Under the Illusions of Grandeur, a book I wish I had when I started vintage racing way back when. It's a guide for men and women over 40 who want to drive like Mario. The foreword is by Past Cars Yeah guest Ross Bentley. And according to Tony Perella, another Past Cars Yeah guest and CEO of Sports Car Vintage Racing Association, Russ's book is a must read for anyone who's considering getting involved in racing. And by the way, one, not just one, but three Lucky Cars Yes subscribers are going to win an autographed copy of Russ's book. He's been so uh, great, gracious to uh, offer three books here. So go to the Cars Yeah website, click on the free book button. I'll send you my free filler up book and your name will be in the hat to win a copy of this very cool read. So Russ, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a moment and share a little more about your career and a passion for uh, racing old cars? Oh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me and having me on. You're welcome. Um, I really enjoy racing old cars, as, as you <laughs> actually covered in detail. Didn't get started on it until much later in life. 49 was the first time I've ever turned a wheel in anger. Wanted to do it when I was a little kid. Uh, my parents thought better of it. As I got older, you know, career, family, life got in the way. And, and about that time, when I was 49, I went to a Porsche Club car show, and they had an autocross uh, you know, school coming up. And, and I had just bought, um, I believe at the time it was a Mazda Miata. And I said, why don't I try this? I've been wanting to do it. And I did. And, and that was it. I was hooked. It has been nothing but that ever since the last 13 years, my life, other than my family and my business, um, revolves around vintage racing now, but I've done endurance racing and SCCA racing, did a lot of autocross, track days, you name it, I bit hook, line, and sinker <laughs> and haven't been able to uh, uh, shake it, not that I want to, yeah. um, but I haven't been able to shake it at all. Now, this book, is this the first book you've written? It is. It it was another bucket list item uh, in life. Earlier in life, I thought I might write a novel of some sort. But after being involved in racing for the last 13 years, I came up with an idea that I, there wasn't a book available to get you started in racing, at least not one that I found. And I decided that this would be a good time to uh, for me to put one together. And it took about uh, almost a year and a half to, to actually get it to the point where I was ready to have people read it. Yeah, uh, writing a book sounds like an easy thing. Um, everyone, oh, go write a book. It's so easy. No, it's not. <laughs> it takes a lot of work to make it right. And uh, I think you hit the nail on the head here. Like I mentioned, back when I used to vintage race, I, I wish I'd had this because it would have saved me a lot of time and money and aggravation, I think. And I love the way you cover a lot of different areas, but it, it's very easy read. It's a fun, light read. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's got a great intro. It even has a, a letter from your wife in the back, which I think was really hilarious. A fun thing to do. Obviously, she, she supports you. And it's 145 pages. Uh, so there's a lot of information in here. So we're going to learn a little bit more about the book. But first, as we continue on your journey, I always like to ask my guests for a success quote or a mantra. This is a nice way to get the inspirational tires smoking here on Cars. Yeah. So Russ, take the wheel. All right. Well, there's there's two things here. One is, you know, to quote a famous movie actor, uh, Clint Eastwood is Dirty Harry. Uh, man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> um, 
But at the same time, uh, one of my early mentors in racing, uh, a guy named Greg Rogers, told me racing is a tough love sport. And what he meant to get across to me at that point was don't cheap out on parts that can not only save your life, but Mm -hmm. they can also make you faster. So I took that to heart and I did make the mistake several times, but I've learned my lesson (laughs) in some cases the hard way. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, it's a a good way to go. And uh, obviously with racing, and and I've I've told people that thought they wanted to get into racing, what you did, I think, was really wise. Uh, Maybe it's because it's what I did. You first try autocrossing to see if you're comfortable going a little faster and and controlling a car. Then you can go do some lapping days at a track with a club, uh, which is a really good way to see if you're really comfortable at speed. And then there's so many op- options these days for racing. I mean, I've had plenty of folks on here from 24 Hours of Lemons, where you can get in really cheap and go out and have some fun. You can go into the SCCA world, which has a lot of options. Vintage racing, ton of options from somewhat inexpensive, and I say somewhat to very expensive, uh, depending on what your checkbook looks like. Um, and then from there, there's all sorts of other options. So there's so many ways to go, aren't there? Uh, it's incredible the choices that you have. Um, I've run almost all of the things that you mentioned. You know, for me, I was semi-serious about trying to be competitive and fast, but recognize that, uh, you know, depending on how fast you want to go, depends on how big a check you want to write in some cases. Right. So I knew I was behind the eight ball with a lot of other people who had been racing in, since they were teenagers. And, uh, you know, here I am starting at 49 years old. So I kind of snuck up on it mm-hmm. and uh, ran SCCA for a few years and realized that while the on-track stuff was fun, the off-track, I was the oldest guy in the in the group, mm-hmm. um, or one of the oldest guys in the group. And and then I discovered vintage racing, which I, to be honest, when I started, I didn't even knew existed. And, and after spending a, a year or so in vintage racing, it was, it just took hold. And that's most of the racing that I do now. I do some endurance occasionally, but I spend most of my time racing vintage because I'm one of the young guys in vintage racing. <laughs> I'm 62. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of folks that are a lot older in vintage racing. But having gone to the historic races down Laguna Seca this past summer, you're seeing some younger people coming into it, which is great. So you feel like the sport's going to continue and carry on. But there's a lot of cool options. And that leads me to my next question. I usually ask my guests to share a story that instigated their personal passion for cars, which usually involves a car in their life of some kind, perhaps. But is there a pivotal moment in your life when you knew you were going to be a car guy? I think I was five. Uh, <laughs> wow. And, okay. And my dad and my dad took me to grew up in Long Island, West West Islip, New York. And my dad took me to the local car races, which were figure eight races back in the day. You know, the old oh, junkers. Yeah. And, and <laughs> never never could figure out how those guys didn't hit each other every time they went through the figure eight course. I know. Yeah. And that was really fun to watch as a kid. But then. At the end of the night, they had a demolition derby. Mm, (laughs) And I have to tell you, as a five-year-old, I couldn't get enough of the demolition derby. And back in those days, there was three TV channels. And every now and then on Wide World of Sports or something, they'd they'd show the demolition derby. And uh, I was riveted. It it was then I knew I was going to be a car guy. Now, what kind of car guy? That developed over the years. (laughs) A lot of different things. But uh, I think I'm settled in now. Absolutely. My dad took me to some of those same types of events when I was a kid. And yeah, I was just always mesmerized by the figure eight. And then when the derby came up, the, the demolition derby, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's actually trying to wipe each other out. Seriously? It, they don't do that anymore, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the attorneys have something to do with that. They probably closed yeah, all those so. all those loopholes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's too bad. It was fun. It was fun to watch as a little kid. That's for sure. Well, let's take a look at some of the roads you've driven down and talk about a big challenge or a big failure that you face. These are wonderful learning lessons, and we can help others who are maybe facing similar situations. So walk us through one of those that occurred with you and tell us how that experience helped you gain even more momentum as you came out of it in your career and your business and your life. I've always had a philosophy in business and and also in racing that you learn more from your failures than you do from your success. Mm, Great. You try not to make the same mistake over and over again. And with my Yanko Stinger, I actually made the same mistake several times. Mm. Um, it all had to do with uh, engines. Corvairs are a little bit finicky. 
because we run the original 140 uh, air-cooled Chevy motor. Mm -hmm. And I built a couple of motors or had a couple of motors built by a couple of different people. And they failed, every one of them, because I picked the wrong people. Um, Maybe focused a little more on how much it was going to cost as opposed to how well it was going to be built. And I finally found my current engine builder, who is uh, absolutely fantastic. And I've been running that motor now for a long time. It also puts out more power than the other guys. So finding somebody with the expertise for your particular need, and that doesn't matter what brand of car it is, whether it be Porsche or BMW or Mustangs mm-hmm. or, um, you know, finding the right guys to to support you because most of us, especially if you're reading my book, you can't do it all yourself. I don't know how to do everything. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I, I do the things I can and, and then get the right people to help me with the other things. Well, it's a really important factor. We have a couple of great fabricators and race car support people here in the Pacific Northwest, Butch Dennison at Dennison International. In fact, I was just at his shop uh, last week. Um, Derek Bell was here for the local PSA, uh, Porsche club, P- yeah, PCA, I should say, <laughs> say that's an airline, isn't it? PCA was an airline. Um, he was here to talk about the 917 racing days and I got to go over and spend a little time with Derek and, and Butch. And then, uh, Louis Shefshik, JNL Fabricating, who uh, helped manage my cars when I was racing. Let me ask you this for those folks out there, cause it's easy to say, well, you got to find the right guy. What kind of advice would you give somebody so they can find the right person? What are some ways to do that so you know you're getting into bed with the right person and not the wrong one? Well, the first thing to do is go look at results. Find out who's winning, who's who's uh, reliable, who's uh, running every weekend when you have one. Talk to the guys that own the same kind of cars that you have. Mm-hmm. See who they use. Build a consensus, you know, talk to people, find out what they like, what they don't like. It's an interview like anything else. And then, yeah. and then go talk to the fabricator. My, my guy is, uh, Jeff Moore from Automotive Archaeologist in, in Missouri, who's six hours away from where I live. It's a six hour tow anytime I need to bring the car up there. Wow. But Jeff is the best I've ever seen. And he manages my, uh, my Yanko and, and the car has been brilliant ever since he's taken over the parts that I don't do myself. Great advice. Great advice. Like much of the advice in this book, it's absolutely brilliant. Let's shift gears and go to the other end of the spectrum. I'd love for you to share what I call a a career or racing aha moment. It's one of those times when the headlights kind of come on and go, that's the track or the line I need to take on this track to get around here a little bit faster. Is there a big aha moment in your uh, racing career or business career you'd like to share? Um, Well, let's talk about the racing career. The aha moment I think I had was probably the first time I won a race in the rain. It was uh, rain racing. You know, I live in Texas, so it doesn't rain nearly as much down there as it might in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Yeah, Um, for sure. So all my friends, I've got a lot of racing friends in, in the Pacific Northwest, and they just can't wait for it to rain. All of them. In Texas, half the guys don't go on track when it rains. So I started to learn how to drive in the rain and realize that patience was the key. Let the race come to you yeah. in the rain and make sure that um, you don't do anything to put yourself out of the race. And and not that earlier this year, I was racing my BMW down at Houston, Motorsport Ranch Houston, and I was in B Sedan. We had about eight or nine cars in B Sedan. Um, I think I qualified fourth. And uh, going through the race, it was pouring rain, and the three in front of me were really fast, but I also knew they weren't overly experienced. And I just decided I'm going to just hold my position and wait for them to make a mistake. (laughs) Um, And sure enough, one by one, they went off the track, slid off the track because they were a little over aggressive, and and I I wound up winning the race. And, And that wasn't the first time that happened, but... My philosophy of racing in the rain is is bide your time. You know, you don't have to go fast until the end. It Be strategic as opposed to trying to be fast. You know, when so. you think about some of the really great race car drivers, Michael Schumacher, Ayrton Senna, who could ride, drive in the rain just incredibly well, and so much above and beyond some of the other drivers that were out there racing with him at the time. Yeah, rain racing is so, so different, but I like your advice because having grown, lived here for 25 years and raced in the rain, my very first vintage race in a Lotus 18 was on a rainy day. I was scared to death. I was sitting there going, oh, am I going to survive? And I remember Louis Shevchik leaning in my car going, how you doing? I go, I'm a little nervous. And he goes, 
Just remember one thing, Mark, the throttle goes both ways. And uh, I think that advice, advice, it was wonderful advice. It's been great advice for life too, by the way. You don't always have to have your foot all the way down um, because you might just go into the wall. Sometimes you have to back off a little bit and, as you said, bide your time. So great advice. I love that. Let's talk about your first really special car, uh, One a car that you got. Maybe it's a race car that had great meaning for you and maybe share a memory you have about that vehicle. Well, my actual the car I'm thinking about is one that I had about 15 years ago. Um, I bought a TVR 350i, it, which is a, a V8, the wedge-shaped TVR, and I bought it on eBay, almost sight unseen. It came here, and it was a mess, and I spent a lot of time and money in making it right, but it was one of three V8 cars in the country at the time, because in England, they sold the the V8s, but in America, they didn't. It was a a V6, and they were pretty slow and and doggy, but this car came out of Canada, and my daughters loved that car. I used to take them top down. We'd go riding around in the country, and I'd have a lot of fun behind the wheel, and and they just loved it, and then it unfortunately died an untimely death when a guy at a inspection station ran it into a wall. Oh, no. Um, but, but that's a different story oh, altogether. Gosh. Oh, no. And, uh, but I, that car I, I miss a mm-hmm. lot. Um, and that was such a fun car, and it was so weird, and, and it was so poorly made. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and it was so much fun to drive. And, you know, I, we fixed everything, so we made it where it was reliable. But yeah. It was, you know, they're handmade cars in England and they never, the company never had any money and everything was custom. Everything was hand built yeah. and it was just such a neat car and wish I still had it. Absolutely. Tell our listeners a little bit about a car you're racing now, this Yanko Stinger. Uh, what do you like about the car? What is a little bit unique and different about the car? Obviously, and for people that don't know what a Yanko Stinger is, maybe explain that a little more. Well, Yanko Stinger is a Corvair basically and and the young the younger folks uh, listening to this probably don't even know what a corvair is but in the in the 1960s chevrolet built a rear engine air cooled car both in two door four door wagon they had a whole series of cars based off the corvair in 1966 don yanko who was a chevy dealer in cannonsburg pennsylvania and a big time scca racer Bought a hundred of them because you had to build a hundred of them to homologate them. In 66, he did it, and then he built a bunch in 67 as well. And he he transformed the Corvair, which was a relatively sedate, unusual-looking car, into a fierce race car that did very, very well in SCCA. Mm -hmm. Um, It's won several national championships and that kind of thing. And there's, I think there was, uh, I don't remember the exact number, it's documented in the book, about 140 Yanko Stingers ever produced with legitimate tag numbers. Mm -hmm. I have the very last tag number. Uh, My car is uh, YS320, and it's kind of a hybrid. It's it's what's known as a blessed tag. In other words, if you could prove to Don Yanko that you built a car to his exact specifications, he might sell you a tag. And Mm. mine was the very last one that he released to anybody. And it's got a history. You know, the tag has a history. Most of the race cars have been rebodied by now, you know, because they've been either hit or rusted out. Or, And I think there's about 40 or 50 of them still known to be in existence, both street and race cars. We had 20 of us, not all were Yankos, but we had 20 Corvair racers at Virginia International. A couple of months ago, SVRA did a Corvair reunion race, and 20 of us from around the country came and raced. And wow. It was fantastic. It was yeah. glorious. Yeah, that's very um, cool. Of course, of course, he's yeah. also known for the Yanko Camaro. Um, yeah. Yeah, which so and many people... Nova, too, I think. Yeah, yeah, the Nova, too. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, And they're even kind of rebranding that a little bit now. Uh, having been recently at SEMA, there was some Yanko vehicles there that are uh, branded with that. But uh, yeah, very cool. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that because, yeah, some folks may go, so Stinger, what? And where did the word Stinger come from? Um, that was his, Don Yanko, uh, just called it a stinger. It, it's, it wasn't like the Mopars with the bumblebee on it or anything. It was just, yeah. uh, uh, just whatever he nicknamed it. And they are for the older car guys. Uh, I think Jay Leno did a whole, you know, bought one and did a whole show on it, mm-hmm. the Yanko stinger. And, and there's some really great cars out there throughout the country, uh, yeah. still, um, 
like I said, about uh, 20 race cars, 20 Corvair race cars, um, about I think a third of those were Yankos. Yeah, they're very cool looking cars. They must be very fun to drive. How about Seller's Remorse? Is there a vehicle you've owned and let go that you wish you had yes. back? <laughs> well, well, there's there's many, as, as I'm sure most everybody listening to this can say, but probably the most recent one was I had a 2000 BMW M5, and it was the first year of that gen, the E39 M5, and it had the motor they put in that thing was a V8, 400 horsepower and it was a detuned version of whatever they were running in in europe at the time the car was just fantastic and i shouldn't have sold it but i did we all have those so don't worry i've heard a, a, a well, well over a thousand of them now <laughs> sharing those so uh at least we can I'll all com- commiserate together well i'd like for you to share a little bit more about this book uh again the title is racing under the illusions of grandeur I'd love for you to explain a little bit why you chose that title. And I'll let our listeners know there's some really cool categories in here. It starts kind of at the beginning about thinking about what you're going to do and are you really having fun and picking the right car and that the fact that winning isn't everything, it's just about participating, what the true cost is, which can sometimes be an uh, eye-raising experience, and can you keep on going forever? And even as I mentioned in the back is a letter from your wife, which I think is fantastic. So. That's my favorite part. Yeah, it was pretty. I went right to that first. I had to just because my wife was so supportive of what I was doing when I was racing and always gave me a blessing, except for uh, in our pre-show chat, I told you about that uh, couple laps she took with Dominic Dobson at Pacific Raceway when she realized, oh my gosh, this is dangerous. And uh, thank you very much, Dominic. He's been a guest here on the show a couple of times. But walk us through the book, why you picked the title and tell us a little bit more about what our listeners will glean from all the knowledge that you've shared here. Okay. Well, the title was originally going to be something slightly different, and I, I, I can share this with your audience because they might get a chuckle out of it. I originally wanted to call the book Racing Under the Influence of Viagra <laughs> um, because it is a guide for men and women over 40, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, you know, But uh, unfortunately, uh, the good folks at Pfizer would not allow me to use the name. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and they wouldn't allow me to use the little blue pill either, because apparently they own that too. I'm sure they so, do. So, yep. um, so this was my backup title, and we're all legends in our own mind when we race, because <laughs> um, the real pros, many of which you've had on on your show, and and a few of which I know, those there's a big difference between pro drivers and oh yeah, what I like to call us schmo drivers, you know, pros and schmoes. <laughs> But we all have that illusion of grandeur in our mind. So that's that's where the title came from. I started racing and didn't have a blueprint for how to do it. And not having raced in younger in life, I was never around racing a whole lot. So I made a lot of mistakes. And the whole genesis of the book was to try to help others make fewer mistakes that I than I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I bought things two and three times. I I bought things on price as opposed to quality or proper fit or whatever. And I made every mistake you could probably make in racing. And yet I still stuck with it. But if I were starting out and I had a book that would help me think through the process the right way, um, because I like to read. And if I would have had that, I would have been able to probably save a lot of money and maybe quicken the the learning curve. You know, there's an interesting story about the book. I had about half of the book done and I was pretty happy with it. And then my computer crashed and I thought I lost it. Oh no. Yeah. And a couple of months went by and I happened to, I I didn't remember that I did this, but apparently I had backed it up at work. And so I'm looking for a file at the office and, and all of a sudden I saw a copy of the book and (laughs) it was like, you know, cause I was so depressed. I was, I was not going to finish the book at that point. And then I got the, I got the book back and nice. Six months later, not even six months later, it was complete. And, wow. you know, I sent it to a couple of folks that I knew, Ross Bentley and, and Tony Perella from SVRA and Tim Sutter from, from Grassroots Motorsports yep. and our own local club president, Herb Hilton, who's a good friend of mine. And, and I sent him a pre-production copy and I said, what do you think? Mm-hmm. And because I wasn't going to publish it. I've never written a book before. And, and they all told me, they really pushed me to go ahead with it. And so I did. Nice. And here we are. So yeah, here we are. A couple months later, we're doing okay. Well, 
Colin, three of those guys, uh, Tim, Ross, and Tony, have all been guests on the show. Great guys. So those were good people to kind of have as a sounding board that would give you great advice and honest advice and uh, not just kind of blow smoke up your skirt and go, yeah, sure, this is great. Go ahead and do it. But uh, Yeah, I can't tell you the quote that, that Tim sent me back uh, after <laughs> Tim Sutter after he read it, but but I did laugh for quite a while. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. I've known Tim for, Tim for a long time. Great magazines he publishes as well. Well, here's a very introspective question for you, Russ. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you were manifested into a car, a vehicle or a race car, parked in a garage somewhere, what would you be and why? That's easy. I'd be a Porsche 911. <laughs> and because, why is that? Because it does almost everything well. And some things great, and it's um, it's made for a purpose, and it's got longevity in history. Nice, nice. Well, Russ, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. What's the worst thing for your car's interior? No, it's not that milkshake the kids spilled in the back seat. It's the sun. Harmful UV rays cook your automobile's interior hour after hour when it's parked outside, even on a cloudy day. What's the solution? Covercraft sunscreens. They protect your dash, seats, and interior finishes from those damaging UV rays while keeping the interior temperature tolerable, even on the hottest summer days. No more painfully sizzling seats and steering wheels for you. They unfold quickly and easily install stay where you put them, and are custom pattern for an exact fit. The foam core acts as a cooling insulator, and you can get yours in different colors and finishes. And they even fold up easily and store under your seat or on the floor. I've used Covercraft sunscreens for years, and they are a fast and easy solution that protect my beloved cars when they're not in the garage. Learn more and order yours at Covercraft.com. Want to protect your entire vehicle? Get a car cover from Covercraft. They have those too. That's Covercraft.com. And tell them Mark sent you. What's every automotive enthusiast dream? To design and build that perfect garage. My friends at Metron Garage are a group of creative talents who've combined their passion for cars with their careers in architecture. Their service includes unique garage design and state-of-the-art fabrication. They will create the coolest custom garage for you and your vehicles. Metron Garage's system features fully engineered commercial grade material and structural framing that's stronger than traditional construction. Their designs are pre-engineered to meet your building codes for fast, bolt-together construction. With over 25 years of experience, you'll see a 3D rendering to visualize your custom garage and the final structure will fulfill all your storage needs. Contact Metron Garage today and begin realizing your dream garage. Go to metrongarage.com. That's metrongarage.com. Garage is built for discerning enthusiasts. Where it's not just a garage, it's where your dream garage comes true. Okay, Russ, we're back. We're entering the last lap. You've been in this position many times. The white flag is out. Time to put our foot into it. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice or racing advice you've ever received? Don't scrimp on on the parts and pieces that you put in your car. Yeah. Um, pay what you need to pay, pay what's, what it's worth. Absolutely. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes? I, I tend to stay with things. I don't give up easily and I'll continue to work and follow through on things even when it's not going well. Now, you mentioned, and I'm going to toss this in because I want to do a shout out. You've had your own business for 24 years now, right? Yes. And what is that business? I own a company. We do employment screening, background checks, and drug testing. Nothing to do with racing. And uh, I kind of feel like we're probably the best company in in the country that nobody ever heard of because we're small and and that's on purpose. How can people find that company if they're looking for those kind of services? The name is Asset Control, so you go to www.assetcontrol.net, or you can just email me at russ at assetcontrol.net, and I'd love to talk to you. Very nice. Now, how about a resource? Obviously, that business is a great resource if you're looking for the right people, but is there another resource you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, since this is a, a car show, I will tell you probably the single best resource I've ever had. And again, I, I like to read. So I, 
I absorb knowledge through reading probably better than any other way. And it's all the books that Ross Bentley has, has mm. written. I've read every one of them. I listen to all his podcasts and I listen, I was even on one of his podcasts and nice. um, listen, you know, listen to uh, all his webinars and seminars. And, and Ross is really, for an amateur racer, there's nobody better. Yeah, he's a great guy. Uh, he lives up here in the Pacific Northwest in when I first started racing, a friend gave me his first book about racing I read. It was very helpful. And when he was interested in starting a podcast, he came up here to my house and we spent a day together and I showed him how I do a podcast and what I thought might work for him. And uh, kudos to him for uh, stepping up and actually producing one. It's a great podcast. For those of you who want to get into racing or into racing, uh, check it out. Uh, really great guy. I like him quite a bit. He does a great podcast. Uh, blog each week too if you want to sign up and you'll get that about racing absolutely absolutely yeah it's great Uh, if i could wave a magic wand and arrange for you to have a drink with anyone in the automotive or racing field living or deceased who would that be it'd have to be Ayrton senna i'm i'm enamored with everything about him yeah absolutely my listeners know this but i'll say it again on the back of my business card is a quote by Ayrton Senna. I always uh, loved watching him race. The movie they came out with about him kind of just solidified my opinion of the kind of person he was. Um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. One of my racing heroes. Now, you mentioned uh, Ross Bentley's books. I always ask my listener, or my, my guess, I should say, for a favorite book. But I think in this case, the book that I would suggest that we post here is Racing Under the Illusions of Grandeur. Uh, again, this book that uh, Russ wrote, he's going to be very kind and give away three copies to some very lucky Cars yeah subscribers. So make sure you go to the Cars yeah web website, hit the free book button, and your name will be in the hat. I appreciate you doing that. Is there another book you want to toss out there for our listeners? Yeah, there's. it's not a technical book, but if you like the history of racing, I just think that... Um, it's called Go Like Hell. A.J. Baum wrote it. It's about the Ford and Ferrari wars yeah. back in the 60s. And that was maybe the best historical account book that I've ever read on automotive racing. I was riveted. Yeah. Well, um, you should go back to the Cars yeah archives because A.J. has been a guest on this show. And he talks at length about uh, writing that book. Um, he's written some really, really spectacular books. So uh, for those listeners that would like to learn more, you can go back to the archives on the Cars yeah website. Just go to the guest section, type in A.J. Bame, and his book will pop up. And he will pop up, uh, Go Like Hell. Yeah, great story about the Ford and Ferrari wars back in the day. You will find all these great links on Russ's show notes page on the Cars yeah website. Just go to CarsYeah.com, type in Russ Rosenberg, and his page will pop right up. All right, Russ. We're up to the checkered flag, something you've seen many times. But in this case, I'm going to throw a little twist to it because today I'm going to buy you any cool collector car or vintage race car in the world. But there's a couple rules to this game. One is it's the only one you can have, so you better pick well. doesn't cost matter what it costs because I'm writing the check, but you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other par, car parts or race cars with. you got to keep it. And you can't park it and just look at it. I want you to drive it, take it out on the track, the road, wherever it might be. So what can I buy you today? Well, I had three that came to mind. (laughs) Of course Um, you did. (laughs) (laughs) One of them would be one of the original Ford GT40s. And another one would be a a mid-80s 930 Porsche Turbo Carrera. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the one I think I would choose would be a Lola T70. Ooh. A serious car, Surtees type yes. car, eh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is, the, uh, that is. I can't describe what that is because hopefully this is a PG show. <laughs> yes, um, it is. But but uh, it is a phenomenal car. I, I got to see one last weekend at Coda, uh-huh. um, and it is just it, it is unbelievable just to even look at it. I mean. And yeah, driving it, I can't imagine, must be fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, incredible cars. In fact, I've got a model of, uh, I'm looking over my shoulder here in my model case, the number seven uh, car uh, that was a Lola T170. Awesome Can-Am cars, pre, kind of pre-wing cars. So they have little, you know, little wings on the back and the front, but nothing serious. I mean, those cars... Those guys back in the day, and I mentioned John Surtees, who's known for racing. I think he was the number three car that he won so many championships in or big championship 
they are scary fast cars. I mean, just serious cars, right? Yeah. Now, never having driven one, I can't. I can't say, but but I. I'd like to try. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so if any T70 owners are out there that that want a copy of my book, I'll trade you for a, hey for a, a, a for a drive at the track. <laughs> You're starting to sound like Bert Levy, the ride mooch here. Yeah, uh, I know. I'm trying know. to jump into cars, but uh, yeah, the T70. I mean, those things had uh, big big block Chevys in them. Is that right? I think most of them did. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, Mark III B Can Am cars. I mean, just yeah. uh, wicked fast cars, wonderful cars, super loud, screaming cars. I'd probably scare myself to death. Uh, yeah, probably. But what the heck? You know, again, the throttle yeah. goes both ways, so it doesn't mean you have to yeah. go full bore. But it's definitely a, a car to learn. And what amazes me about all those Can Am cars of that era is that those guys went out and raced for like endurance races. I mean, just long, you know, hours in those things, just turning laps over and over and over and over and I mean, it had to be a handful. Well, that's the difference between the pros and the schmoes. There you go. Right? The famous quote right there from Russ, the difference between the pros and the schmoes. I love it. Well, Russ, you've taken us on a great ride today. Nice trip around the track a few times. I really enjoyed getting to know you better. I uh, want to thank you for sharing your journey. Could you offer our listeners a little piece of wisdom or guidance before you rip off down the track in that Lola T70? Sure. The big thing to make sure is that you're having fun mm. because unless you're a pro driver and getting paid to do it, the reason you do it is to enjoy yourself. And if it if it stops becoming fun, it's time to reevaluate and realize what you're doing. Absolutely. Great yeah. advice. And what's the best way for our listeners to get their hands on a copy of Racing Under the Illusions of Grand? It is available on Amazon, but I Sure, greatly appreciate it if you would buy it direct because I think I make about ten cents for every book Amazon sells. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the book's only nineteen ninety five. So uh, txcoyoteracing dot com. Um, so it's Texas Coyote Racing, but Texas is short in the TX. Okay. Um, and if you go to the website, there, click on Racing Under the Illusion of Grandeur, and there's a right in the middle of the picture is a button that says Buy It Now. There you go. I'll make sure I put a link to that. On Russia's show notes page on the Cars Yeah website. And again, one lucky, nope, three lucky. That's very cool. Cars Yeah subscribers are going to win autographed copies of Russ's book. So make sure you go to my website, carsyeah.com. Click on the free book button. I'll send you my free filler up book. It's an ebook. And your name will be in the hat. And we'll give away three copies right before the holiday season, which is pretty kind of you. So thank you for doing that, Russ. Thanks again for being, for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, and for sharing your experiences with us. Awesome book. I love it. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for having me. You're welcome. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important, too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimble.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.